رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا غريب مظلوم كربلاء ما خاب من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ إليكم يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما محمد إلا رسول قد خلت من قبله الرسل أفإن مات أو قتلا قلبتم على أعقابكم ومن ينقلب على عقبيه فلن يضر الله شيئا وسيجزي الله الشاكرين صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Another salawat for the love of the أهل البيت عليهم السلام A third salawat for the love of Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. This past few years, and specifically the past few months, the world has witnessed tension, the world has witnessed violence and crimes in the Middle East, in the countries that the Muslims live in. Year after year we see that the crimes and the violence is escalating and the whole world is watching the Muslims kill one another. The whole world is watching the Muslims butcher one another. We see wars, we see crimes, crimes against humanity that is disgusting to even see, let alone talk about. Today, the world is witnessing and the whole world is watching innocent people be killed, innocent people massacred in Syria, in Iraq, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, and in other parts of the world. But these places where Muslims are killing one another. 
in Bahrain. We see crimes. We see atrocities being committed against the followers of the Ahlul Bayt. And all of this is happening in the name of Islam. Everything that's happening, it's happening in the name of the religion of Islam, in the name of Rasulullah and in the name of the Quran. This past year, the whole world witnessed a man eat the heart or a liver of another person and call out Allahu Akbar after he does it. The whole world witnessed the grave of one of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayh be attacked and demolished. Hijr ibn Adi al-Kindi. His grave was attacked and allegedly his body was exhumed from the grave. Allahu alam what happened. And the whole world witnessed and saw a Shia scholar a scholar who believes in the Ahlul Bayt, butchered in Cairo, in Egypt, with a few others on the 15th of Sha'ban while they were remembering and celebrating this holy holiday. And he was dragged in the streets of Cairo after he was butchered. These are all crimes against humanity that the whole world is watching. But there is one important point that we should note and that is all of this, all of these things that we are seeing today, they are no surprise to us. Everything that we see today has its roots. Yes, the only difference is that today what we see is in the television, the whole world is watching it. Otherwise, what we are seeing is nothing new. All of these things have, have happened before and history keeps repeating itself. This is not a new phenomenon what we see today. The followers of the Ahlul Bayt have been massacred and have been butchered and crimes against the Shia and against the followers of the Ahlul Bayt are, have been committed ever since the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. This is not anything new today. Today the only difference is that the whole world is watching. Before it might have been hidden from the eyes. Before, no one used to see what would happen. No one used to record what happened. But today, the whole world is watching. But the crimes are the same. The reason is the same. And the same perpetrators, they are the same. And the same mentality and the victims are also the same. During the time of Rasulullah, it was the family of Rasulullah that were butchered. It was the followers of Rasulullah, the ones who loved the Ahlul Bayt, they were the ones who were killed. Today we see the same, the ones who love the Ahlul Bayt and the ones who follow the Ahlul Bayt, the same thing is happening to them. Today we see people go and attack the grave of Hijr ibn Adi 1300 years ago, 1200 years ago, Muawiyah he killed Hijr ibn Adi. The crime is the same and the same mentality is attacking the same group of people. Today we see a man eating the liver of another person. 1400 years ago, there was a lady who stood over the body of Hamza, the uncle of Rasulullah, and she ate the liver of Hamza, the uncle of Rasulullah, after mutilating his body. That was Hind, the mother of Muawiyah. Today we see a man be dragged in the streets of Cairo for his crime that he loves the Ahlul Bayt. This was his crime. 1400 years ago, 1300 years ago, there was also a man who was dragged in the streets of Kufa and that was Muslim ibn Aqil. Why? For his love for the Ahlul Bayt. For his love for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. So there is a chain, there is a connection between the, between the victims today and the victims before. And there is a connection between the ones who are carrying out these violent acts of terrorism today and the ones who carried them out before. Now, the only thing is that history is repeating itself. But today people ask the question, today non-Muslims are seeing what's going on. Muslims are seeing what's going on. They ask the question, why? Why so much division amongst the Muslims? Why so much division within the Muslims? Why is there so much bloodshed within the Muslims? 
Why are the Muslims not united today? This is a question that many people ask. We ask this question today. Why is there so much division? What's going on? Why can't the Muslims unite on the simplest of issues? You see that there's no unity. Today, Saudi Arabia, it's teaming up with Israel against a Muslim country. Muslims cannot unite right now. Why? There's a reason behind this. The reason is not something that we hear about today, not something that happened today. The reason goes back during the time of Rasulullah And the first reason for the division within the Muslim Ummah is that the Muslims, the people after Rasulullah, they left the clear path that Rasulullah and Allah had appointed for them. Allah had a plan. Allah created this universe with a plan. He created this universe. He created the solar system with a plan. Everything is in its spot. Everything is functioning properly. The solar system is functioning properly because Allah placed everything in its specific spot. From starting with the cell, going to the solar system. Allah has placed everything within its boundaries and has placed everything with exact measurements. Allah says, خَلَقْنَا كُلَّ شَيْءٍ بِقَدَر When I created, I created everything with qadar. Allah has destined for everything to be in its specific place. Starting from the cell, the nucleus, and going up and up, and bigger and bigger things. And also when it comes to religion, Allah has also placed things in its spot. Allah created us and Allah sent us prophets. And after prophets, Allah sent us imams and guides to guide us after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And then Allah says, وَإِنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلُ My sirat, my path is mustaqim. It's a straight path. There's one path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلُ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ ذَلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Allah says there's only one path that brings to me. There's only one road that goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all other roads will mislead you. One day Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayh, he drew a line in the sand in front of the Muslims. And then he drew other lines next to that line. Then Rasulullah says, the sirat to Allah is only this line that, I, that he was pointing to. He says, all other lines will mislead you. Then he recited this verse, وَإِنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلُ Do not follow the subul, the other paths, because they will derail you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is the sirat al-mustaqeem? That is the sirat of Rasulullah and the one who Rasulullah appointed for us and that is Ali ibn Abi Talib and the Imams after Ali ibn Abi Talib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed a leader for us. Allah sent Rasulullah for us. Can someone follow a prophet other than Rasulullah and say, no, this person is chosen by Allah? No. Because Allah chose Rasulullah. Well, for that same reason, no one can come and follow anyone other than Amir al Mu'mineen and say, This person is the Imam. Because Allah is the one who chooses the Imam. Allah is the one who chooses the leader. And Allah says in the Quran, in numerous verses, that He is the one who chooses who is the Khalifa. He is the one who chooses who is the Imam. Allah says in the Quran, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةِ Allah tells the angels, I have done ja'al. Ja'al means I have appointed. إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةِ Allah uses this word ja'al, meaning that He has placed the khalifa on earth. In another verse, Allah tells Prophet Ibrahim, speaking about Prophet Ibrahim, وَإِذْ ابْتَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بكلمات فأتمهن قال إني جاعلك للناس إماما 
Allah tested Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Once Prophet Ibrahim succeeded in the test, Allah tells him, Inni ja'iluka lil nasi imama. I have chosen you as an imam. I have chosen you as a leader. Then Prophet Ibrahim, he asks Allah, Qala wa min Also, will my children receive this, this level of imama? This position of imama? Then Allah replies to him, قَالَ لَا يَنَالُ عَهْدِيَ الظَّالِمِينَ An oppressor does not take this position that Allah appoints. A zalim cannot take a position. A zalim cannot say, Allah has chosen me to represent him. Allah does not choose a zalim. And this is one of the proofs of the asma, one of the proofs of the infallibility of the prophets and of the imams. Because Allah says, a zalim cannot take up this position. We have numerous verses where Allah says, I am the one who chooses. I am the one who appoints. Ya Dawood, inna ja'alna ka khalifa. O Dawood, we chose you as a khalifa. So this means that the, this is the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to choose who is the leader. And Allah did choose a leader after Rasulullah. Today, there is no historian, there is no scholar that can deny the event of Ghadir. From the Sunnis or the Shias. The event of Ghadir was narrated by thousands of the Sahaba and thousands of the companions attended. Between 100 to 120,000 attended the day of Ghadir. And they all gave allegiance to Amir al Mu'mineen on that day. This was the plan of Allah that was carried out and executed by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi when he stood and he chose Amir al Mu'mineen to be the Khalifa. After him, the Imam after him, and the Muslims gave allegiance to Amir al-Mu'mineen. But of course, there were individuals who thought that they were above the law. Like in every society, you have people who are criminals. They want to be above the law. They want to break the law. They think that the law does not have to do with them. The law applies to everyone else, but it does not apply to them. These were the individuals that gathered in the Saqifah. And before Rasulullah was even buried, Rasulullah was not even buried. They came and they gathered in the Saqifah and they broke the rules of the sky. They broke the rules of Allah and they broke the rules of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Rasulullah before his death, he wanted the city of Medina to be empty from the companions. There was an army, there was a battalion outside under the leadership of Usama. Rasulullah, he tells all of the Muslims, go and join the army of Usama. I don't want any one of you inside Medina. I don't want any one of you in the city. He saw that the companions, they knew that Rasulullah was going to die. Some of them, they kept sticking around. Rasulullah tells them, leave, leave the city. He wants the city to be empty so that Amir al Mu'mineen, there will be no one against him when Rasulullah passes away. They don't leave. Then Rasulullah, he says, man an Usama. May the curse of Allah be upon the ones who do not join the army of Usama. But there were some that did not join. And those were the first people that Rasulullah cursed. They ask, why do you curse? Why do you do la'an? Rasulullah, this is a hadith that's accepted by all the Muslims. Rasulullah, he says, la'anallah man takhallafa an jayshi Usama. Go and see who did not join the army of Usama that day. And they gathered in the Saqifah. And they rebelled against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. They rebelled against Rasulullah and Allah foretold this in the Qur'an. Allah says in the Qur'an, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلْ أَفَإِنْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلْ إِنْ قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ O oh, Muslims, Muhammad, he's Rasulullah, he's either going to be killed or he will die. أَفَإِنْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلْ Allah says, Allah leaves it open. He does not say what happened to Rasulullah. أَفَإِنْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلْ إِنْ قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَقَابِكُمْ You will turn back over your heels. Everything that Rasulullah taught you, his whole life, he dedicated his whole life to guide you. 
the moment he dies, you will turn back. And then Allah says, whoever turns back over his heels will not harm Allah and will not harm Rasulullah. This person will only harm himself. And they gathered in the Saqifah. And they chose their own leader on that day. And no one was allowed to say anything. No one was allowed, there was, no one was allowed to be in opposition. And anyone who, st- who stood in front of that establishment was immediately wiped out. Starting with Fatima, the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. No one was able to stand in front of that establishment. Even one of the companions, one of the leaders of the Ansar, who was also in the Saqifah, Sa'd ibn Ubadah. This man was trampled and he was beat up on the day of the Saqifah. And then eventually he was killed because he remained in opposition to that establishment. Of course, after they kill him, he's a sahaba, he's a, command, he's a, he's a companion of Rasulullah. After they killed him, who should they blame his murder? Who should they blame to, of his death? They blamed the jinn. They say the jinn killed Sa'd ibn Ubadah. They say we heard the jinn reciting, نَحْنُ قَتَلْنَا سَعْدَ بْنَ عُبَادَهُ وَرَمَيْنَاهُ بِسَهْمَيْنِ فَلَمْ نُخْطِئْ فُؤَادَهُ We are the ones who killed Sa'd ibn Ubadah and we shot him with two arrows and we did not miss his heart. This is how some Muslims are fooled today. The jinn, they kill a companion of Rasulullah. After Fatima, it was the day of Saqifah that caused the ambush on the house of Fatima al-Zahra. It was the day of Saqifah that caused the murder of Amir al-Mu'mineen. It was the day of Saqifah that caused the murder of Imam al-Hasan, the poison of Imam al-Hasan. And it was the day of Saqifah that was the reason for the murder and the massacre of Ashura. Imam al-Hussein, the hadith says that Imam al-Hussein on the day of Ashura after he fell from his horse. An arrow hit the heart of Aba Abdullah. Imam al Hussein, he placed his hands under his heart and he threw it in the sky. He threw the blood in the sky. Not one drop of blood came down. Then he placed his hands again under his heart. This is what the maqatil write down. This is, what the, this is what's written in history. He placed his hands under his heart and then he wiped it all over his face and all over his beard and then he began to say, هَكَذَا وَاللَّهِ أَكُونَ حَتَّى أَلْقَى جَدِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ مُخَذَّبٌ بِدَمِي وَأَقُولْ قَتَلَنِي فُلَانٌ وَفُلَانٌ He says, this is how I will stand in front of my grandfather Rasulullah مُخَضَّبْ بِدَمِي with drenched in my blood and I will tell Rasulullah قَتَلَنِي فُلَانٌ وَفُلَان And we all know who Fulan and Fulan are. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam he blames his death and his, his martyrdom on the first two. Fulan and Fulan. And until today you see there are people that defend this group. Until today you see people that ignore the sunnah of Rasulullah and follow the sunnah of this group. The ones whose hands are stained with blood of the Ahlul Bayt, the holiest, the holiest creation after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So the first reason for Islamic extremism and division, division within the Muslims is because the Muslims, some of the Muslims, they ignored the direct order of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa The second reason for the major split within the Muslims today, where even the non-Muslims are mocking the Muslims about, is the level of ignorance within the Muslims. The jahala. The ignorance, the state of ignorance that the Muslims have to deal with today and are dealing with today. Ignorance is a disease. Sometimes someone can have a physical disease. That would be better for that person than to have a spiritual disease. Or a disease 
of ignorance. The worst disease any group of people can have is ignorance. And today, the Muslims, they are suffering from this ignorance today. The illiteracy rates within the Muslims today, st statistics show that in the Muslim countries, the illiteracy rate is between 30 and 40, 35 and 45 percent, only in the Arab countries. This is the level of ignorance that the Muslims have to deal with today. And what kind of people are these? These are ones who are Muslims. And you don't find any other religion other than the religion of Islam that stresses on education and knowledge and seeking knowledge. Compare the religion of Islam with other religions. You see that there is no other religion like the religion of Islam that stresses on seeking knowledge and the importance of knowledge. And the first verse that came down was Iqra, read. We have so much narration, so many narrations, so many verses in the Qur'an that stress on the importance of seeking knowledge. You don't find this in other religions. But where are the Muslims from the teachings of the Qur'an? Where are the Muslims from seeking knowledge today? And this is the reason the Muslims have fought, fell. This is the reason the Muslims are divided today. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, قَصَمَ ظَهْرِي إِثْنَانِ Two groups of people have broken my back. Amir al-Mu'mineen, the commander, the one who is so strong, the one who is so powerful. He says, two groups of people have broken my back. Who are these groups of people? Alimun mutahattik wa jahilun mutanassik. The first one is a alim, a scholar that breaks the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The alim that gives fatwas, alim that gives religious fatwa, when he knows that what he's doing is wrong, but he took money from the governments. He took money from the king. He took money from the emir. And he's willing to give any type of fatwa for the sake of the money. And the second category, the second group of people, وَجَاهِلٌ متنسك, A jahil, an ignorant person who acts like he knows everything. An ignorant person who's also giving fatwa today. How many, how many are giving fatwas today? Why are there Muslims killing one another? This is not just a normal person, they go to Syria or they go to Iraq and they're killing Shias. This is because it has a fatwa, it has a leader. There's a scholar, either a, either a scholar who's alim mutahattik, who does, not, who's a, who does not have boundaries and does not fear Allah, or this is an ignorant person who's wearing the clothes of a scholar. And he's giving them the fatwa. Today the ones who are killing, the ones who are abusing, the ones who are terrorizing, they have a scholar that is telling them what to do. But they are ignorant. They don't go and research. They don't go and see reality. They don't go and see that this does not make sense. This is against the logic of Islam. This is not against the logic of Quran. And this is against the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Today, something that would shock you. And every, the whole world was shocked when they heard this. There's a fatwa where the, the prime minister of a country, he had to go out and he was embarrassed because of this fatwa. There's a type of jihad that's going on today. This is not the jihad where the men go out and fight. This is jihad of sexuality. Jihad al-munakaha. We heard about this recently, a few months ago in the news. When we first heard about it, no one believed in it. But recently, the prime minister of one of the countries that were sending thousands of women to go to Syria to do jihad. But what kind of a jihad? A sexual jihad. Is this something Islamic? The prime minister, he goes out and he's ashamed. He's saying hundreds of women, thousands of women are coming back to his country pregnant. And every one of them, she says she was with hundreds of men. Is this Islamic? Where in the Qur'an do we have this? Where in the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt do we have this? Where does Rasulullah teach us such a thing? 
But this is because of the ignorance, the level of the ignorance within the Muslims. We are taught to question, we are taught to ask, we are taught to analyze and do tadabbur, think, ponder. This is what the Quran speaks about. Afala yatadabbaroon al Quran. Do they not ponder? Do they not think? Do they not realize of the verses in the Quran? Rasulullah, how many narrations does he have? He says, Talabul ilm faridah. Seeking knowledge is a religious duty. Religious duty. He does not say it's something that you should do for entertainment or something that you want to do. It's a religious obligation to seek knowledge. Seek knowledge even if it's in China. That time, how far was China? It would take years and months to, re to reach China. But he says, even if you would have to go there, seek knowledge. This is what the religion of Islam teaches us. But today, unfortunately, Muslims are very ignorant. Muslims are very far away from intelligence and Muslims, many of them are illiterate. Many of them cannot even defend their own religion. When their religion is being attacked, they don't know how to defend their religion. They don't know how to defend their values. We have to seek knowledge. And ignorance is one of the reasons of the Muslim division today. And when people are ignorant, they start fighting with one another. When people are ignorant, they start fighting and abusing one another. Allah says in the Qur'an, وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشَلُوا وَتَذْهَبَ رِيحُكُمْ Do not, do not argue because you will fight and you will fell and people will laugh at you. And this is what's going on with the Muslims. Who are the ones who argue? Who are the ones who do not know how to disagree with one another? There's nothing wrong with having different views. But the problem is when you cannot tolerate someone else with different views. There's nothing wrong with being talking to someone who has a different view. This is what the Rasulullah teaches us this. The akhlaq of Islam teaches us this. The akhlaq of the Ahlul Bayt teaches us this. But today there are people, and even within our communities, we're not talking only about Muslim governments, we're talking about a family. A small community, a masjid, a place, you see two people, they're arguing with one another and they can't stand one another and they keep fighting with one another. Allah says, وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا فَتَفْشَلُوا You will fall and people will make fun of you. We all saw a few weeks ago the government shut down. Why was there a government shutdown here in the United States? Because they couldn't get along with one another. And the government was shut down and the whole world was mocking this government because of their division. This is the same when it comes to the Muslims today. This is the same when it comes to the Muslim Ummah today. So this is the second reason, the ignorance within the Ummah today. And the third and final reason that I will mention today, the, the third reason that the Muslims are divided today, and there's so much division today, is that the Muslims have left one of the core teachings of the religion of Islam. And that is Al-Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi an al-munkar. Enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. This is one of our obligations. It's an obligation upon us to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. And Allah tells us if you want to be the best nation, if you want to be the best ummah, you have to do that through Amr bil ma'roof and nahi an al munkar kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrajat lin nas ta'muruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna an al munkar the best ummah the best ummah is a ummah the best community the best group of people are a group of people that continue to reform themselves reform their society reform their community reform their government reform themselves and their own selves this is what makes a ummah the best. An ummah that forbids evil. An ummah, a group of people that when they see something wrong, they go and they stand up and they take the responsibility and they take the initiative to stop what's going on. This is how an ummah will be successful. This is how a, any organization, any government, any company will be successful if it has the system of checks and balances. 
the reform. Without that, any government, any society, any community will fall. Allah says in the Quran, وَلْتَكُنْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Let there be a group of people, a group amongst you that does amr bil ma'roof, enjoin the good, forbid the evil. Those are the successful ones. Today, the Muslim ummah is suffering because there is no one that does amr bil ma'roof. And when someone does amr bil ma'roof, this person is seen as the wrong person. Rasulullah, he says this. Rasulullah, he says, a time will come upon my ummah that the ma'roof will be seen as munkar and the munkar will be seen as ma'roof. The good will be seen as bad and the bad will be seen as good. In the name of education, in the name of civilization, they come and they say, why do you do this? And they come and they make the ma'roof look like it's evil. And this is exactly what Imam al Hussein alayhi salam did. Imam al Hussein he saw that the religion of Islam was dying. A man like Yazid was taking the power and sitting on the member of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He stood. He had to do Amr bil Ma'roof. If he does not do Amr bil Ma'roof, then who will do Amr bil Ma'roof? Who will defend the religion at that time? No one did Amr bil Ma'roof. Only the 72, the 73 in Karbala did Amr bil Ma'roof. That day, Imam al Hussein he kept calling, he kept asking for help. No one joined and helped Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Imam al Hussein he did Amr bil Ma'roof against the tyrant Yazid. You want to know what kind of a person Yazid is? Look at what he did. Yazid only ruled for three years. The first year, he killed Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. The second year, he attacked Medina. He attacked the city of Medina, the grave of Rasulullah, and thousands of people were killed. He attacked them and he tells his army, he tells his soldiers, go and attack anyone, and Medina is halal upon you for three days. After that incident, no man was able to come out and say, my daughter is a virgin. Because they were attacked and they were sexually assaulted even next to the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Waqa'at al Today in Baqi' you go to the Baqi' you see there's a specific place of the cemetery where there are the shuhada that were killed in that incident. The incident of Waqa'at al the incident that Yazid, he made Medina be halal upon the army of Sham. And they went and they attacked. The third year, he attacked the Kaaba. He attacked the Kaaba. He demolished the Kaaba. This is Yazid. And until today, you see people, they come and they say, Don't talk about Yazid. Don't, don't mention Yazid in a, any negative way. Until today, you have this group of people. And this is why, until today, we hold the majalis of Imam al Hussein. This is why, until today, we remember Imam al Hussein. Because until today, there is a Yazid. Until today, there are groups of people that have the same mentality of Yazid, the same mentality of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, and the same mentality of Umar ibn Sa'ad. Umar ibn Sa'ad, after killing Imam al Hussein, he tells his army, Urkabu, ya Allah, urkabi wa ruddi sadr al Hussein. He says, O oh, horsemen of Allah, ride your horses and stomp the chest of Aba Abdullah. He says, the horsemen of Allah, in the name of Allah, in the name of Islam. So today when you have people killing, terrorizing in the name of Islam, don't be surprised. Because these are the same people. These are the same group of people. But Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he had to do amr bil ma'roof. He had to enjoin the good. If he does not do it, who's going to do it? He stood before reaching Karbala, he stood in front of the army of Hur and he said, I heard from Rasulullah saying, Man ra'a sultanan ja'iran mustahillan lihuram Allah, nakithan li ahdillah, 
مخالفا لسنة رسول الله يعمل في عباده بالإثم والعدوان فلم يغير عليه بفعل ولا قول كان حقا على الله أن يدخله مدخلا He says, Rasulullah says that if anyone sees a sultan, a leader, oppressing and abusing and killing, and this person does not say anything or does not do anything about it, then Allah has the right to take this person and throw him in the hellfire. Imam al Hussein, he stood against Yazid, not because he wanted power. Today, some people they say, Imam al Hussein, he was after power, he was after wealth. Imam al Hussein was never after this. And the proof of that is that his father was never after this. Imam al Hassan was never after this. He knew that he was going to die, but he had to do the Amr bil Ma'roof. He had to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. And this is exactly what he did. So these are the three reasons why there is division today within the Muslims, within this Ummah. The first is that they left the teachings of Rasulullah and the Qur'an. Second is the level of ignorance. And the third is the lack of Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi an al-Munkar. Enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. So don't be surprised today when you see the Muslims are being attacked left and right. Don't be surprised. Because Rasulullah foretold this. Rasulullah, he told the Muslims exactly what will happen. He says, كيف بكم إذا تداعت عليكم الأمم كتداع الآكلة على القصة؟ He says, how would you feel if the nations attack you just like the wolves and the animals attack a piece of meat? The Muslims they says they tell Rasulullah this will happen to us. He tells them yes, this will happen. They tell him is it because of our we are going to be outnumbered? We're not enough. He tells them, no, you will be many. There will be too many of you. But the problem is that there is nothing holding you down. There's nothing holding you. The iman is not strong enough. You know, when there's a flood, there, there's the trash that is carried with the flood. It goes wherever it's taken. Rasulullah says, this is how you will be. You will be like this trash that is carried by the sail, by the water. And this is the situation of the Muslims. And today, we are witnessing it most right now. Look at what's going on in Syria. Muslims killing one another. And we cannot go, go and visit the shrine of Sayyida Zainab salam because of what's going on. We were allowed, we used to go and we used to pay our allegiance to Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam. But now we can't go there anymore. We can't go and give our condolences to Sayyida Zainab for what's going on. For how long now, how many months, how many years has it been that we have not, Shias are not going to give their condolences to Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam. Ummul Masaib. The mother of Masaib. How many tragedies does she have to face? Until today, she is Ummul Masaib. What's going on? Today, they want to attack her shrine. They want to demolish her shrine. Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam. It's as if what happened to her on Karbala was not enough. It's as if what happened after Karbala was not enough. Until today, there are groups of people that want to demolish the shrine of Sayyida Zainab. بأبي التي ورثت مصائب أمها فغدت تقابلها بصبر أبيها لم لم تلها عن جمع العيال وحفظهم بفراق إخوتها وفقد بنيها. The poem says, سيد زينب inherited the مصائب of her mother فاطمة. And she faced them with the sabr of her father, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Lam ansa idha taku himaha fanthanayat tashku lawa'ijaha ila hamiha. He says, I cannot forget 
how what happened to her when they attacked her brothers when she was all alone and she wants to go to her brothers to complain to them what happened to her but there is no Abbas to complain to there is no Imam al Hussein to complain to Sayyida Zainab was all alone this is why she inherited the Masaib this is why she is Umm al Masaib Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam she married Abdullah ibn Ja'far. But before her marriage, there was an agreement between Imam al Hussein and Amir al Mu'mineen and Abdullah. And that agreement was that Sayyida Zainab will never leave Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. She will always be with Imam al Hussein. If Imam al Hussein is traveling, she has to be with Imam al Hussein. This was the agreement. And there was a very strong attachment between Imam al Hussein and Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam. They both witnessed the loss of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. They both witnessed the ambush on the house of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. They both were orphaned. They both lost Amir al-Mu'mineen. They both lost Imam al-Hasan. And they were attached to one another. The hadith says, it is said that one day, Sayyida Zainab, after her marriage, Imam al Hussein used to always go and visit her. He had a very strong relationship with his sister. One day he visits her and he sees her sleeping. But while she was sleeping, the sun was coming from the window and it was striking her face and it was on her body. The narration says that Imam al Hussein he stood in front of the sun. He stood in front of the sun so that it will not harm her, so that she could sleep in peace. She wakes up, she realizes Imam al Hussein is standing in front of the sun so that she can sleep peacefully. She kept in mind that one day I have to do this for Imam al Hussein. One day I should stand in front of the sun while he's sleeping. What day was that? That was on the day of Ashura when Abba Abdullah was beheaded and he was being burned by the sun. She stood over the body of Abba Abdullah. Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam, she wanted to pay back Aba Abdullah al Hussein. She wanted to give a sacrifice to her brother Imam al Hussein. The first of Bani Hashim that was killed was Ali al Akbar. She wanted, she wanted to show Aba Abdullah that she is supporting him as well. She had her two sons with her, Aun and Muhammad. She tells them, Oh my sons, I need you. I cannot ask you, but I need you. This is something that you have to do to defend Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. They tell her, Oh mother, we will defend you. We will defend our, our uncle Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Aun and Muhammad, the sons of Abdullah ibn Ja'far. They say their farewell to their mother Zainab. They say their farewell to the woman. The women are holding on to them. Don't leave us. These are the children of Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam. But Sayyida Zainab, she's trying to hold back her tears and she wants to tell them, go ahead and support. She doesn't want to show them any signs that she's not supporting them. They go out, they say their farewell to their uncle Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Then they go and they fight courageously. They show them, they show them the bravery of Abdullah ibn Ja'far and the bravery of Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam. After fighting courageously, they were killed one after the other. They fell on the ground calling out Aba Abdullah, calling out for the help of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. But they were killed that moment in the battle. Bani Hashim, they came and they carried them. They, pl they placed them between the shuhada. They placed them between the martyrs. They placed them next to Ali al-Akbar, uh, next to Qasim. 
next to Habib ibn Mudahir. Imam al-Husayn, he's looking for Sayyida Zainab to give her his condolences, to tell her that you have lost your son as well. But Imam al-Husayn cannot find Sayyida Zainab. He goes in the tent and he sees her thanking Allah, thanking Allah for allowing her to also sacrifice and give a shahada. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. As-salamu ala al-Husayn wa ala 